the effectiveness of an advocacy group depends tremendously on the dedication and enthusiasm and real conviction of the people who are in it. Those people who started out that gas organization, they really believed it. They happened they were believing the truth. But they were really committed to it. They just really wanted to get the air cleaner. And that's just the sole thing. There was nothing, no guile, no chicanery, no nothing, just to get clean air for us to breathe. There were so many days that it was literally so black when you drove from the higher parts of Birmingham into the valley. You couldn't see. It, it really was so nasty, you couldn't see, and you knew you were breathing it. There would be, um, at that time, I actually hung my clothes on a clothesline. They were nasty. There would be specks of dirt or, you know, the things from the air. It was not healthy at all. My mother died of lung cancer when I was 20 years old, which is another thing that spurred me into the whole clean air. Uh, she, grew, she grew up in a mining community, and I'm sure that's where a lot of it started, but she lived in Birmingham from being a teenager till she died at 45, and I don't think the air helped her lungs at all, and uh, that was hard. I was 23 or 4 when I got involved with gas. And uh, I didn't have any community activities going on at the time. Boy, that changed fast. It was formed in the late, well, maybe late 69, but it really started getting organized in uh, 70 uh, in preparation for the first Earth Day. GASP is the Greater Birmingham Alliance to Stop Pollution and its mission was to stop air pollution in Birmingham, Alabama, which was... Oh, it was horrible. I live here on top of the mountain, and you literally, all of the houses on my street, which overlooks the city of Birmingham, were built with their porches facing south because there was literally no view. You could not see Birmingham from the top of the mountain on many, many days. And it did not take much to prove that people were very sick out there because of the air pollution. The largest, the sources of the air pollution in Birmingham were uh, primarily heavy industry. We have a, had a heavy steel foundry industry. Those industries, the Alabama Power Company, coal burning power plants uh, were a huge contributor. They had all invested heavily in lobbying against clean air legislation and in lobbying for weakening anything that passed. Our larger industries fought the hardest because they had deeper pockets to hire lawyers. They'd had lawyers on staff for years who had made a career of keep, well, not a whole career, but of keeping um, environmental regulations to a minimum on all of the aspects of these large industries, solid, water, solid waste, water, and air. I got involved in gas because I was a young mother of a four-year-old in 1970 when we had the first Earth Day. And so I answered the call. As a young mother, it's sort of like, what kind of world am I gonna leave for my child? It was formed to educate the people of Birmingham about the impact of air pollution on their own health and on the health and economy of the whole community. We felt that we had to dramatically awaken people to the effect of air pollution. It was Earth Week and we had a lot of people 
already activated. And at that time, I-2059 stopped right in front of the Inslee Works. You were facing a long array of belching smokestacks. And members of GASP stood at the exit with surgical masks over their faces and they handed out a little card that said what the particulate matter was and said, if you are concerned about this air pollution, please call the following numbers. Cameron and I, I remember standing with her on a street corner wearing a gas mask and we were passing out phone numbers for the uh, leaders of U.S. Steel. They got so many calls that the Vice President of U.S. Steel accused us of handing out his home number. But people, you know, an astonishing number of people in Birmingham know how to use a phone book. And they had his name, they looked him up and hounded him. The second year was one of my favorites. We had it at the zoo and uh, Bob Truitt was a big believer in students being involved in making a change and he gave us one of the cages at, in the ape house. He took all the apes out. As you came into the house, you looked at different types of uh, primates and then as you moved to the last one, you were confronted with college students. And there was a sign that said, species, homo sapiens, characteristics, makes war on its own kind, destroys its environment, uh, pollutes its water supply, pollutes its air. And we filled it with junk and the kind of things litter. And my son again was probably about five by then. And my son loved it. He was swinging on the monkey bars like a monkey. Well, my mother was horrified. <laughs> she, and she didn't want my grandfather to find out about it. She was really embarrassed. People were shocked. And I thought it was great. It made the point very clearly. Those were the kind of dramatic things you did, and you had to. And they got attention, and they were fun. <laughs> In November of 1971, Birmingham was suffering from an inversion. The air in Jones Valley was trapped by the layer of air above it and the particulates from our heavy industry became more and more concentrated in the bowl of the valley. It was probably about the worst that it had gotten. I mean it really got national attention. It was so bad. The levels built up over time and peaked at 771 micrograms per cubic meter, uh, which was how they were measured as a result of the Clean Air Act. We did not know when the weather would change, but it was a very clear health crisis. I just remember being scared for my son's health but it, it was scary and it, you know, it was embarrassing to have your city known as probably one of the worst polluted in the nation. The health department kept constant track of, of uh, the particulate levels and the state health officer, the county health officer, George Hardy, had been in constant contact with the state attorney general, Bill Baxley, as this happened. They issued a request to all the local industries to cut back their productivity 60% to uh, reduce the amount of pollution that was being put in, into the air. They didn't ask them to shut down, they just asked them to cut back. They got very little compliance. The smaller industries were willing to, but the larger ones just made a, a dismal show of it. And when it was clear that wasn't gonna work, the uh, Bill Baxley uh, and uh, George Hardy, the health officer, asked EPA and the Justice Department to come in and uh, shut these industries down. 
they came in and gasped, met them at the airport with uh, reporters and lots of fanfare. And uh, they went to federal court to Judge Sam Pointer, who issued a temporary restraining order, despite objections from the industry's lawyers, and uh, shut the industry down. And he shut them down. And it was the first time it had happened anywhere. They were outraged and they yelled federal interference in state matters, all sorts of typical um, cries from the past. I think it was an eye-opener for the local industry. They realized that the public had become aware of the health impact of what they were doing. They realized that the federal government had the moxie to step in, and they realized that the state government uh, had the courage to call them in. So they uh, started lobbying against the regulations that would follow from the State Clear Clean Air Act. And uh, they had really tried to push it off. They'd spent a lot of money uh, forestalling uh, pollution control. So then they started working on how to make the standards as lax as possible. The um, magic of GASP, I think, was that it pulled a, a, a swath of age groups together from, say, senior and junior, senior in high school, all the way up to young professionals. Um, the reason being that in 1970, 71, that 18-, 20-year-old Voting Rights Act was passed. And so what we had was a large group of newly enfranchised voters and a large group of uh, aging white male legislators who were scared to death of them. So how we made things happen in the legislature was to take school bus loads full of high school and college and graduate students to the legislature, stand in the balcony when the Clean Air Act came up and point at them. And they were scared to death and they voted one of the strongest Clean Air Acts in the country very quickly. Yeah, well, GASP, GASP is the organization that brought into focus and brought to the attention of, of people who are in position to make things happen the importance of air pollution in Birmingham. I mean, it's just that important. I hope the legacy we left behind was clean air. Uh, and uh, we had a lot to do with working on clean water, but there's so much left to do. I wish uh, and I'm sure that that will uh, happen with the coming generation. I don't know why they're not in the streets with machetes right now. I really don't. Well, any dirty air can uh, make children worse and adults worse if they have respiratory problems to begin with. And if they don't have respiratory problems, then it can start making respiratory problems. So statistically, we know that the dirtier the air, the more respiratory problems there are going to be in that neighborhood. We've certainly studied downwind of plants in England and downwind of, of uh, plants in, in the States. And we know that the respiratory diseases are much worse in those zip codes or those areas downwind of the plants than they are upwind. So we know uh, by science and looking at uh, the irritation, we know by, by what happens to children that, these, that the air pollution does make lungs worse for children. As a physician in Birmingham, you can't help but take care of people with respiratory illnesses. Respiratory illnesses are a leading cause of children coming to the emergency department. 
whether it's uh, asthma, colds, irritation, cystic fibrosis, pneumonia, respiratory problems still are a leading cause. And they're so bothersome because the child is aching to breathe and wants to breathe and having so much trouble and short of air, short of oxygen, and the parents are worried sick about it. And this, you know, you'd like to prevent that from happening. And if we can clean up our air, then a lot of these diseases can be made less dangerous, less harmful, less bothersome. This uh, is a piece of human lung from somebody who lived in the country, never smoked, and had no air pollution. Now this is a middle-aged person. That lung is, is almost completely white, very uniform. Are you able to see that on your picture? Uh, and the, uh, so that's a normal lung. And in contrast, here is a lung in someone who has emphysema. You can see that the lung, are you able to see the little holes in it? Those little holes, it's like a piece of Swiss cheese, only a lot more widespread openings in the lung. The lung itself has been destroyed. This patient was living only by virtue of the oxygen that could be absorbed in this little bit of lung right down in here. There's a little tiny speck of good lung up there. Maybe a few alveoli, air spaces here that can absorb air. My interest in air pollution is my interest in the second largest factor that we can attack in the cause of chronic lung disease only behind cigarettes. The public needs to know that air pollution is a hazard that is so available to be attacked. I mean, you take a breath of it every breath. The air we breathe every day determines what's going to happen to us. Living with asthma for me is knowing that I should have my rescue inhaler with me most of the time. It means um, I can't go outside very much on bad air quality days. And that's sad because I, I love the outdoors. I'm from a family that grew up being outdoors and doing outdoor things and that's not my lifestyle right now. Having lived in Birmingham all my life, I feel like I have sort of an accumulation of years of uh, pollutants in my air passages. I just kind of imagine the pictures they used to show you in elementary school about what happens to your lungs if you smoke. Well, that's sort of what I imagine my lungs might look a little bit like. The improvement in air quality over what we had in the 60s is spectacular, and that's not good enough. A comparison with the past is the wrong basis for, the wrong standard for anything you're trying to evaluate. That you, you evaluate everything in terms of what the ideal would be, and what is the risk-benefit uh, ratio for the distance we are away from the ideal. If our air is not ideal and it results in one extra death per year in the state of Alabama, I'd say if that also means that we have good jobs for 10,000 people in Alabama, I'd go with the latter. It's a risk-benefit equation. But mostly, most air pollution cleanup, the only risk is it costs some money to buy the stuff that you put it in there. And that's not a very painful penalty to pay compared to having, you know, this in your chest.
I can still see days when there is a lot of pollutant in the air. In addition to being a health problem, it's an economic problem now because it's, you cannot get a, 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 a permit for any kind of pollution in Jefferson County because the air, air quality standards have not been met. That means no development of that sort. And why that hadn't occurred to the industrial development people, I don't know. It's a major problem.